your praises and hear your word preached. Come back and get us, Lord. Uh, God, I pray you just uh, help us as we uh, uh, go into the rest of August. It's uh, it's the height of uh, hurricane season, Lord, and everybody's worried about all the uh, storms and everything, Lord. Uh, you are uh, very good to us, Lord. You've kept everybody safe through the years, God, and uh, God, I thank you for your watch care over us. Uh, God, I pray you will stay busy for you. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us for the tomb of our lost world rest the sea. Day by day his sweet voice sounded. Sing, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star. From each idol that would keep us, saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, those of all in our love. Especially if you're trying to sing the harmony. Alright, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And tonight we're going to look at verses uh, 6 through 11. And we're going to look at four things that you need to avoid. Four things you need to avoid. Now, Paul um, considered all his churches kind of like his uh, sons and daughters. He would go into an area and he'd preach and a lot of people would be saved. And, and uh, he had a very fatherly outlook to them. And uh, thus he would write these letters to them. That he would hear that things weren't going well or 
that uh, to, to the people they would send to help him that maybe there was an issue that he needed to address. Well, in chapter number 10, that's what he's doing. He's, uh, he's kind of addressing some issues here, and uh, some of them aren't very good, but, but some of them we need to take heed to because we don't need to fall into the same trap. And there's a lot of Christians that fall into this stuff nowadays. Uh, I would say the 20th century Christians have been worse about it than any other Christians in history, but that probably wouldn't be true because uh, people are people no matter what time of uh, era they lived in. So let's read it, uh, chapter 10, verse number 6, 1 Corinthians. Uh, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and to play. Uh, and, and, and rose up to play, rather. Uh, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. And that's that thing I was talking about this morning about the, the serpent on the pole. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for your admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, and help us to learn the lessons that we are to learn from history. Lord, this is Bible history, but it's still history. And help us to avoid these pitfalls, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you do study history, uh, ancient history is littered with the dead civilizations that have existed before us. Uh, Egypt. You go to Egypt and you'll find a little bitty country that's kind of, uh, it's a third world country. They've got some ruins that people you know, come look at and pay money to see. And that's about all that's going on in Egypt. And you go over to Babylon. Now, Babylon is a modern Iraq. Uh, uh, Saddam was trying to rebuild the city of ancient Babylon as a tourist attraction. I don't think he got very far. Uh, but that's the point. It's a bunch of ruins. Um... Then you go to the island of Greece that was the center of the Greek civilization. And there you'll find all kinds of ruins. I mean, there's ruins everywhere you look. You, uh, you go walk down a path and stump your toe on an ancient temple or something there. Uh, but, but, you know, they're just all crumbly. Um, there, there's talk about rebuilding the Parthenon, but, you know, I doubt they're going to do that. If you want to see what the Parthenon looked like... Uh, Go over to Nashville, Tennessee, and they built a, a replica of it. You can, and it looks like it did back in the day, supposedly. Um, then there's the Romans. Now, the Romans built a vast and mighty empire, but all over Europe there are ruins of the Roman Empire that's gone. It crumbled. And even civilizations after the Romans that came along. Uh, I mean, if I said the Holy Roman Empire, some of you probably wouldn't even know what I was talking about. It's gone. Uh, Hitler wanted to start a third Reich, the third king. It was supposed to be the third incarnation of the, the Roman Empire. Well, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't last hardly uh, two decades. Uh, and you look at our republic. Uh, if you look at history, you will find that republics didn't have a long history to begin with. None of them did. And here we are, and we're on the rotten edge of being just totally gone, folks. Our country, the good people of our country need to stand up and say, we want our country back for God, is what it needs to do. But uh, you know who's holding our country together? Now, this may surprise you, and I have Bible evidence for this if you ever want to go into it, but we are. Us little Bible-believing churches. And they're all over the place. 
I traveled seven and a half years in this country, and I visited over 600 of them. In this, and, and they're everywhere. They're just, they're just little bitty churches uh, in every nook and cranny in this country. And they haven't got very many more people, or some of them got less people than we do. And they're just itty bitty little, little bitty places. And they pray, and they believe the Bible, and they, and they work hard every day, and they trust the Lord. And, and we're, we're, uh, we're the termites that are holding it, the, the bureau together, like the old joke, uh, you know, about the termites holding the, the house together. But folks, if we are going to make it as Christians in this age, there's four things we need to avoid. And I'm going to talk about these four things. I'm not going to name them. I haven't got four points. I'm not going to preach on these things directly. I'm going to preach on them, but I, I'm, I'm going to take them kind of as a group because they're all really grouped together. So there's, there's three things I need to say about these four things. The first of all, I want you to notice that Paul, he starts giving them examples of bad behavior. Examples of bad behavior. And uh, you say, well, shouldn't we avoid bad behavior? Yeah, but we ought to learn from bad behavior. Uh, the trouble is with men, they don't learn from history. And those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Verses 6 through 8 talks about the bad examples we have. Now, I want you to notice that one of the first examples he gives us is the lust after evil things. Now, if, if you want a kind of a, a fun thing to do, uh, get, on, get on YouTube and type in old commercials, okay? And you'll get about a dozen uh, YouTube videos on commercials they don't play anymore. Now, some of them uh, are like uh, commercials that would be banned today. And, uh, you know, they're about cigarettes or, or something that, you know, is kind of, kind of taboo today. And those are kind of funny. Uh, but some of these uh, commercials, uh, you can see a definite trend, okay? Um, Americans were pretty innocent back in the 1800s. And the reason that was is because most of them lived in a small town or on a farm somewhere. Or if they lived in a city, they stayed in their own little uh, community. They didn't, they didn't go outside probably, uh, you know, four or five blocks. And uh, their school was there. Their, their, their places where they bought things were there. Their houses were there. Their, their parks were there. And uh, on the farm, they all were just there making the farm work. In a small town, of course, it's a, a little a tiny knit community. And, and so you didn't have a lot of influence from the outside that came in. But when the 20th century came along, we had a, a, a kind of a quantum leap uh, in technology. Um, at the end of the 1800s, uh, they invented this thing called an automobile. Uh, which meant you didn't have to depend on the train. You see, if you wanted to take a train, you had to go down there and you had to buy a ticket, you had to get a train schedule, and you had to figure out when your train was leaving and where it was going and how many stops it would make and you know which, you know, which route you wanted to take and all that stuff. It was kind of a little bit complicated. But with an automobile, you would just uh, fill the thing up with fuel, you get in it, and pff, off you go. And then uh, around the turn of the century, these guys named Orville and Wilbur Wright decided to invent something called an airplane. Well, that means you didn't have to drive on the roads. You could just fly over everything. It was a lot faster. And, uh, you know, as the 20th century went along, soon we had jets and things. And we could get from point B to point, point A, uh, you know, real quickly. 
But that also meant that that little isolated town and that farm where people uh, just basically knew their family and their workers and, 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 you know, the people they sold their produce to. And that little town where, where, you know, everybody knew one another. And that little, you know, five or six block place in the city where, uh, you know, all the Italians lived or all the Germans lived or all the, you know, whoever lived there in the city uh, that, that knew each other. All that was kind of gone. Because everything coming, started coming in from the outside. And the devil saw an opportunity. He saw an opportunity to introduce Americans to the evil things, now listen carefully, that had ruined Europe. You know one reason why the Roman Empire collapsed? It didn't so much collapse from without. It collapsed from within. It became morally bankrupt. And it came, it became uh, it's sort of, uh, uh, there was an ambiguity as far as what was right and what was wrong and what was uh, keeping the law and what was not keeping the law. And, and, and Romans, became, even, though, even though the Christian church was the official religion by the end, the Roman society was anything but Christian. And when the Visigoths came, all they had to do is kind of touch the, the shell and it would class. Uh, Brother Clay, you deal with old cars. Have you ever seen a car that looked like it was painted up pretty good, but you touch somewhere and what someone had done is figured out how to way to, to polish over the, the rust and then paint it? And you touch that place and you know what happens? Crumble, crumble. And you got a hole in your body all of a sudden because underneath is nothing but rust. You know what you got to do? You know what you got to do. You got to strip all the paint off and start over. And then sometimes you get enough paint off there and you figure, well, there's no hope for this thing. <laughs> and you just scrap it. And that's the way the Roman Empire was. They came along and just kind of touched it and went, Pfft. And that affected millions of people that lived in the empire. All the way from England and all the way to almost Persia. And the reason being is they were lusting after evil things. But you know what the problem with lust is? Lust comes from in here. And all the devil has to do is dangle some purdy out here and the lust that in here says, gimme, 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 I want it. So what you have to do, children, is you have to watch what's in here and say, no, I'm not going to listen to that little voice in my head. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. All the devil has to do is introduce some little thing you want, and the rest is kind of an automatic thing if you let it go. And it will destroy you. It will destroy your life. It will destroy your health. It will destroy your testimony. Uh, lust does never anybody any good. And eventually you'll end up in the graveyard because of it. 1 John 2.17 says, The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, they're, one of the first examples we have is the lust after evil things. And there's lots of evil things out there. Do you know why we have uh, non-broadcast television setups now like Hulu and Netflix and stuff? Is because in order to broadcast on cable or satellite or broadcast TV, we have a government setup that has rules that they have to follow. Well, they don't have to follow the same rules on these other things that come up on your computers. And so they can show anything they want. And they do. I've got some of these programs that I've uh, uh, that were shown, and I'm surprised at what they get by with. They'd never get by with that uh, on ABC and CBS and NBC or Fox or anything else. Or even on some of your cable channels. Uh, you would have to get the Playboy channel to get some of that stuff. And I'm a kid. And people are lapping that stuff up like crazy. And bringing it into their homes and showing it to their children. 
What sank the Titanic? What sank the Titanic? Was it the ice that they hit? Was it the cold of the ocean or the air on that particular? Was it the damage done to the ship by the ice? No, no, it wasn't. None of those things sank the Titanic. Someone has pointed out that it isn't the ship in the water, but the water in the ship that sinks ships. A ship can ride out the most severe storm so long as it isn't capsized or punctured so that the water gets inside of it. There may be great external threat, but if the water can be kept out, the ship will remain afloat. What sank the Titanic was the water. And that's what happens to Christians. Oh, they may go along, they may hit, you know, big chunks of things in their life. They may rip holes in the side of their Christian testimony and life. They, they, may, uh, they may even feel the cold of God's uh, lack of fellowship. But it's the water that comes in from the world that sinks them. Not only was there lust after evil things, but there was lascivious worship. Notice the Bible says they got up, rose up to play. Now Jesus teaches a different thing. Some people, I don't know why they go to church. Um, I go after church to deposit uh, my paycheck that y'all so wonderfully give me on Sunday mornings into my bank, uh, my credit union, because I really don't want to get out Monday and go back, back over across town. I'm lazy. But it, it's across the street from one of the bigger independent Baptist churches in town and I won't tell the name. Two years ago I saw a Jeep being raffled in front of that church. Then I saw a boat a couple weeks ago being raffled in front of that church. This morning there was not one, two, three, but there was five food trucks in front of the front entrance and they were having I guess their version of dinner on the grounds. And I thought to myself, is that what it takes to get people into a big church now? Food trucks. God deliver us. God deliver us! That's not why you should come to church. Look, people on YouTube that live in Pensacola, if you want to come to church and you're expecting a food truck or a boat or a Jeep or something like that, stay away! Because you're not going to have it here. What you're going to have here is this. And this. And this. So why is that? Because this, that, and this has been good enough for 2,000 years to keep Christianity rolling along. And it's still the only thing that really works. What did I say to you, Linda? I said, that guy, I felt like going over there and looking up the pastor and looking at me in the eyes and saying, how you get him is how you lose him, buddy. How you get them is how you lose them. I'm not against food trucks. I'm not against dinner on the grounds. I'm not against a lot. Of, I'm, 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 I, I take a little umbrage at raffling a Jeep. That rankles me a lot. Huh? Show me that in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4. You say, you're preaching about independent Baptist, brother. Yeah, I am. Because if anybody needs to stand up for Jesus, it's us. If we're just like the rest of the rotten denominations out there, what's the use? And believe me, some of the denominations are rotten. They're so rotten, some of the people, he, he, some of the same people are pulling out of them saying, we don't want nothing to do with this anymore. This has gotten too bad. I don't blame them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 19 who being past feeling have gotten given themselves over to lasciviousness. Now children, if you don't know what that is, you ask mom and daddy. To work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so that ye be have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Jesus teaches us a different way, folks. We have to say no 
to ourselves a lot. No. I want that cookie. No. Well, I want I want to sleep 15 more minutes in my nap. No. I, 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 I don't want to go to work today. No. You have to tell yourself no constantly. No, 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 no. The biggest, the most useful word in the Christian vocabulary is no. It's okay to tell yourself no. That's not what the world teaches. The world teaches us say yes to everything. Really? What good did that do Greece? What good did it do Babylon? Huh. They were partying the night that Babylon fell. So you got lust after evil things. You got lascivious worship of the falsehoods. And you got loose morals that you need to stay away from. Loose morals. Now those are three of the things you need to avoid in your life. Children, what's a moral? A moral is a rule in your life that you're not going to violate. That's what a moral is. You know what moral people do? Moral people look down at the speedometer and they see, oh, I'm going 70 to 50 mile an hour. I better slow down. That's what moral people do. Because if you're going too fast, you might kill somebody. And you certainly don't go 70 miles an hour down a 35 mile an hour zone like they do down my street. A moral person... Passes by on the street and they see a fruit stand. A moral person sees the guy in the back looking the other way. A moral person says, well, I could take this apple off this cart and put it in my pocket and nobody would see me. A moral person says, no, I won't do that. I'm going to pay for it. One of the most aggravated she got at me one time is uh, we were at the checkout at uh, Walmart and, and we were uh, getting some change uh, back, you know, with our uh, receipt and everything, and the lady gave us too much money. It was it was like five dollars, and she said, "Well, you you can just wait." Uh, I mean, you, you know, I mean that's their mistake. I said, "No." I went out and I got in the car, I opened the gate, and I went right down to Walmart. I went to the customer service place. I stood in line about twenty minutes. And I got up and I handed the lady the five dollars and said, the lady at this checkout gave me too much money. And her jaw came down and she said, you're actually returning this? I said, yeah. She said, you could have kept it. I said, no, I can't. I said, you could have kept it, but I couldn't. And she said, well, thank you, Mr. Benton. From that day forward, they know me at that Walmart. Everybody in that store knows me. Because I'm the guy who ba brought back the five dollars. I didn't have to. You got to have some morals in your life, and you and you got to have enough backbone to make them stand. Because one of these days, well, let's look at second. For I mean, First Peter, not Second Peter. First Peter four, verses one through five. For as much, then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his uh, time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. For in times past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust. Excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? One of these days we're going to stand before God and he's going to judge us. You need to stay away from these things. They're bad examples to us. The children of Israel were always getting into trouble. But I do want to point out that those people that came out of Egypt, the adults, they never made it to the promised land. Their children did, but they didn't. 
And I've seen that in America. I've seen people that were older generation than I have. Uh, the, the real swinging uh, decades were the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And those people who were adults and the movers and shakers, a lot of those people just did, didn't make it very well. And God, God judged America. We were, we were blessed of God to have someone like Ronald Reagan. We didn't deserve him as president. We really didn't. So, Christian, stay away from these things. And then, there's one more thing we need to look into before I give you an admonition. The second point is the example of bad attitude. See, not only is the things you need to stay away from behaviors, but there's attitudes you need to stay away from. Number one is tempting God. Verse number nine says, neither let us tempt Christ. I said, what in the world is tempting God? Well, you, you, you say, well, I know you're God, but maybe you can't do this. Or, or I don't know, God, you may not love me. And I, you know, there's all kinds of ways to tempt God. It's, it's kind of almost like mocking God. And you know where that comes from? It comes from getting discouraged. One of the biggest tools the devil has is discouragement. Numbers 21, verses 4, talks about the Israelites, the Israelites as they marched out of uh, Egypt and into the wilderness. And it says, They journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. You say, Brother Jeff, have you been discouraged? Oh, yeah. I've let the devil get to me every now and then and got discouraged. I stayed discouraged. Look, when I was on the road for seven and a half years, it was hard not to get discouraged. Because you're going to church after church after church after church, and preacher after preacher after preacher would shake your hand and say, you'll be hearing from us. You never did hear from them. And that's discouraging. Discouraging. And the people spake against God. And against Moses. Wherefore ye have brought us up out of Egypt. To die in the wilderness. I've met people like that. For there is no bread. Neither is there any water or soul. Loads of this life bread. All we got is this stupid manna. Uh, every day. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. You better not get too discouraged. You better try to stay positive. You better try to look in faith to God and your leaders. Uh, if you've got good leaders, you need to trust that God can manipulate them. God was feeding these people every day. Look, if they wanted something different to eat, all they had to go down is to their own flock and kill a lamb or a goat and have some, have some stew. They didn't do that. You ever wonder why? And they got murmuring. They were tempting God and they were murmuring and complaining. That probably is the number one sin among Bible-believing Christians is murmuring and complaining God is listening to all of them. Now, Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. He, he was sitting there writing the book of Lamentations as he was uh, sitting among the smoldering ruins of his hometown that he preached in, Jerusalem. The temple was gone, the buildings were gone, the walls were gone, the people were gone, and here he is, he's writing Lamentations. If anybody had a right to complain and murmur, it was Jeremiah. But you know what Jeremiah said? Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass? Well, God is. When the Lord commandeth it not... So he says, uh, who, who is a man that's going to say something's going to come to pass when God says it's not going to come to pass? You can talk all day long, but you're not going to out-talk God. 
Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Wherefore doth a living man complain? Well, that's a good question. A man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto the God of heaven. So Jeremiah, sitting among all this destruction, he's saying, why do we complain? God gave us what we deserved. We, we took his mercy and his wonderfulness for years. And, and look, America has taken God's grace and God's mercy and God's love for years and years and years. And it still turned its back on God. It's only a matter of time, folks. We're the only thing holding this thing together. You better stick with God. You better stick with God. Some years ago, a man living in Wales had the misfortune of being involved in a mining accident. And it necessitated the amputation of his right leg. After a period in the hospital, he went to the prosthesis maker to be supplied with an artificial leg. When the appendage had been strapped to the stump, which was all that remained of the injured leg, the attendant requested that the patient get up and walk around the floor. Awkwardly, the man struggled to his feet and staggered across the room, then dragging himself painfully back to the chair, he slumped into it, utterly exhausted and discouraged. That's not how you do it, said the attendant. Watch this. And the attendant walked around the room very gracefully and, and kind of did a little pirouette and, and, and just, just said, that's how you do it. And the patient looked up and says, ah, oh, that's easy for you. You don't have a disability. He said, oh, I haven't. And he pulled up on both his pants legs. Instead of one artificial leg, that man had two artificial legs. Look, there's always someone that's got it worse than you. I don't care how bad you got it, someone has it worse than you. There was lots of times I would kind of get in a grumpy mood on the road and then I'd run into this church and there was some guy in a wheelchair wheeling through the, the vestibule of the church and he would have his a wheelchair all festooned with tracts and Bibles and things and God would say, see there? He, he's not complaining, and I would say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. Well, there's an admonition that Paul gives here, and it's directed right at you guys and me, because we're living in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, says, This know also. Then the last day's perilous time shall come. Amen? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, truce breakers. Boy, there's a lot of those. False accusers, incontent complainers, fierce despisers of those that are good. Man, we got those by the dozen. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having the form of godliness and denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep. They're creepy. Creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You think with all the internet and phone uh, apps and everything we got nowadays, people will be as smart as ever. People are dumb, man. The biggest complaint I hear from employers is my employees aren't very smart. Why is that? They got more education and more access to 24-7 knowledge and they don't, they don't know anything. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, 
So do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. But thou hast known my doctrine, fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came upon me at Antioch, at uh, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Hallelujah. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So what's your, what's your forecast about America? We're going to get worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know what we live in? We live in a crum crummy time. There's crummy people leading us. There's crummy people teaching us. And I gotta say, the people we hold up, a lot of them are just crummy. Crummy, crummy, crummy. And there are certain persecutions that are coming. Persecution is coming. It really, truly is coming. It might be hard for us ima to imagine such things happening today. We believe that our bill beloved Bill of Rights would protect us from such things as outlawing of evangelism. The reality, though, is that the local newspaper recently reported on the front page an instance of religious freedoms in jeopardy. The article was about an 11-year-old uh, boy in the Norm school system in Oklahoma who was told not to discuss the Bible or even to pray by himself during recess. Because a parent had complained that it would be disruptive to her children. What in the world does that even mean? Disruptive? The kids are probably a bunch of uh, wackadoos, they're probably disruptive themselves. The school district further states that the girl had infringed on the rights of the other students by praying. A commentator commentated, I have seen several things take place during recesses. This is an observer that came to the school and wrote about this. Uh, and said, uh, both while the student, a student and later uh, as a substitute teacher, among other things, I saw boys fighting. I saw girls arguing. I saw hair being pulled. I saw kids being picked on. I heard all kinds of foul language. And I wondered why if a girl with six of her friends was reading the Bible and praying, it could be any more disruptive disruptive than these things to the other kids. And why we have to infringe on a little girl's right to read the Bible and pray. She said, I remember the school days with the Bible on the bookshelf and lively re religious discussions. We certainly did not consider ourselves religious fanatics or prospects for a lawsuit. What happened? Why are things like flag burnings and Satan worship and unseen material and, and those kinds of forms of expression being forced and protected by the Bill of Rights, yet an 11-year-old praying is found questionable? And folks, this is an old article. Things have gotten 100 times worse than this. But you know, I want to say lastly, this is part of my admonition to y'all as Christians. And I want to say this supremely and utmostly and absolutely, positively, that Jesus Christ is still the answer. Years ago, we had banners and signs on cars that says, Christ is the answer. Well, Christ is still the answer. He's still the answer. 
And I don't care if we end up living a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now. Christ will still be the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. Paul said, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But he's still the answer. He's still the answer. In conclusion, brother, that was a good song you picked. In the hour of trial, and that one we sung uh, right before the sermon. Those kind of songs we don't sing very often because they're difficult, and they're 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 kind of a they're kind of, people call them a downer. I mean, you sing like "Are You Lost in the Blood?" You know, it's kind of a upbeat song, uh, or, or "Power in the Blood," or you know, "Victory." But you sing some of those little songs like like we sang and heard about today, and and, and it's like Jesus to his disciples. When he called his disciples, you know what he said to them? He said, follow me. Follow me. John 12, he was fixing to go to the cross. And it's interesting. He, he went all the way back with his disciples to the time when he called them. And this is what he said. He said, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servants be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So Jesus brings them all the way back to the day when they were called by him. And he says, look, if you're going to continue to work for me... You have to keep following me. Because Jesus is still the answer. You say, what's the answer to all our problems and all our moral dilemmas and all? Jesus is still the answer. That's what you need to go tell people. It's not politics. It's not a certain candidate getting elected. It's not a change in the school board or the, the county council or the state legislature. It's Jesus Christ is still the answer. And he will help you avoid the pitfalls that are everywhere around us. Someone wrote this about his brother. He said, I will never forget my younger brother rebelled against my father one day. He did not like my father's rules. Now my little brother was the Maryland State Wrestling Champion in the unlimited weight class. At 250 pounds, he was big and strong. My father told my brother to do something. I don't remember what it was exactly. But my brother didn't think he should have to do it. So he frowned and shook his head and said, no. My father said, oh, yes. And my little brother said, no. My father took him upstairs, helped him pack his suitcase. My brother, what they call jump bed. He said, yeah, I'm leaving and I, I don't have to take this. So he took his suitcase and he left. He walked out of the house, but he forgot a few things. He forgot, well, he didn't have a job, for one thing. He forgot that the snow was snowing outside very hard and it was cold. He forgot he didn't have a car, but he jumped bad. He was going to prove his dad wrong. But he forgot that when you don't have anything, you don't jump bad. 20 minutes later, 20 minutes. Knock, knock, knock on the front door of the house. Brother was at the door wanting to come back home. <laughs> his hair was full of snow. His coat was snowed. His suitcase was snowed. He was shivering. 
My father delivered him to the elements that he might be taught respect. When he was put out, my brother was no longer under the protection and custody of our home. He had to fend for himself. He lasted 20 minutes. Look, a lot of people don't want to be under God. There's a lot of advantages to being under God. Because we don't have the same thing God has. We don't have the same power. We don't have, we don't have the, the, the wherewithal to, to get from A to B. It's like our missionaries. They, they're under God. They tr they've gone all the way around the world trusting God. So the next time the devil sits on your shoulders and says, Hey. He's not paying attention to you. He's not answering your prayers. Why don't you, why don't you just chuck it all and, and forget that Christianity mess? Don't you do it. You know why? God will help you pack your suitcase. God will let you go out the front door. But you'll be back. The Lord, let me back in. I'm sorry. Avoid those things God tells you to avoid. Be smart. God always has our best interests at heart. And Christ is still the answer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he's still the answer. God, I've looked to you. I've looked to my Savior since 1973. It's been a long time ago, God. But God, you've uh, provided for me. God, you've led me in the way. You've given me a purpose in life. You've given me a job to do. You've given me power to do it. You've given me rewards for doing it. And Lord, I find today when I have a problem that all I have to do is go to you because you can answer the problem. Thank you, Lord. Please help our country, help our people. God, it's a scary thing to know that we're one of the only things holding this country together. A little bitty church in the back end of nowhere. But help us to stand and help us to be firm. And God, hold on till you come. God bless us as we go. Please protect us from the devil and his wiles. Help us not to get discouraged. And I pray that uh, we'll give you thanks for the, what you do for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.